Hello, everyone. It's good to see you tonight. It's good to see you tonight. Um, I trust that it's been a good week for you. Uh, we've had uh, quite a few neat things happening on the Bible study front. Um, we had a nice crowd on Wednesday morning over at uh, Town and Country. That was really nice. It was nice to see some of the new folks and and um, nice to uh, to be able to discuss God's word openly. Um, God is good, and he continues to be good to us. Now, as you're tuning in, there's a couple of things we always ask if you would do for us. One of those is, would you please uh, consider signing in and saying hi in the comments section? Just hello, or I'm watching, or whatever. And uh, if you're too shy to do that, though, that's fine. Just uh, hit like or um, or love maybe in the reactions uh, section up there in the corner and um, then also we invite you to share this if you're on Facebook and uh, if you're on YouTube uh, we ask that uh, you would help us uh, to be more visible by liking and possibly subscribing to the channel uh, just so that uh, this kind of video, this kind of instructional Bible study video can be seen by more people. Um, other than that, I, I uh, really appreciate whoever is watching, uh, whether directly or not. Good evening, Daryl. Good to see you. And um, if you're watching this later on, that's okay. You can ask me questions still. Use the comments section, ask questions. Facebook lets me know. I can answer your questions then. But uh, it's just as as well, if you're watching live, that you go ahead and do that anyways. Um, I'm just going to quickly put my phone onto airplane mode so that it doesn't keep beeping all night long. But uh, anyway, uh, we're going to go ahead and, hey, Faye, Faye how are you doing? Uh, good, 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 good. Uh, loved seeing you guys Wednesday, by the way. That was great. So um, we're, we're going to be picking up, uh, there's a, a study guide on the Facebook page. It's a little bit down. You'd have to scroll up to find it. Uh, but if you want to print it out, you're welcome to. Otherwise, just hang on and we can do that. We're going to have a word of prayer and then we're going to get started, okay? Father in heaven, how kind you are, Lord. You are so beautiful to us. You have given us beautiful weather today here. And you have also given us beautiful neighbors and friends. You have uh, helped us, Lord, along the way. And we pray, Lord, that even now you would help us even more. For, Lord, we realize how quickly glory fades uh, from corrupted flesh. And so, Lord, we come to you every day to renew that. Give us our manna today, Lord, I pray. And supply us, Lord, for... Uh, for our hearts are certainly hungry for you. Uh, we love you, and we look forward to what you have for us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, we are going to start in Matthew chapter 21, verses 23 to 27. Now, this same story is repeated in Mark 11, 27 to 33, and also Luke 20, 1 through 8. So, um, but we're going to use Matthew's reference uh, to, uh, for the sake of our study. So verses 23 to 27, uh, picking up at verse 23. And when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one question, which if ye tell me, I in like wise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, uh, whence was it from heaven or from men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, Now if we shall say from heaven, then he will say, Why did you not believe him? Uh, but if we should say of men, 
the uh, we fear the people for all hold John as a prophet and they answered Jesus and said we cannot tell and he said unto them neither tell I you by what authority I do these things now this is uh, and this is part of uh, the events of Passion Week we've already at this point, uh, at the beginning of our study guide, we talked about the uh, triumphant entry. So let's take a look here. Discuss Jesus' wisdom here and what is the likely motivation for his retort given what we have learned to this point. Okay, we've learned a lot. Okay, so let's talk about some of the foundational things that we've learned. First of all, that Jesus came to serve the Father. Hey, Kendall, how are you? Good to see you. Jesus came to serve the Father. He came to model what it is to be an obedient servant for our sakes, okay? And he was an obedient servant because part of the Son's uh, eternal, part of the Son's eternal uh, makeup is that he is a servant to the Father, uh, just as your body is a servant to your mind, uh, or your soul is even a servant to your mind for that matter. And the Holy Spirit also uh, serves the Father. And the Holy Spirit, of course, laterally works with the Son, helps the Son. Uh, the Son has said in John 16 that the Holy Spirit would take from what was his and give it to us. Um, so there is, there is certainly uh, a unity in the Godhead. And uh, we say that they are all co-equal, and they are co-equal. Um, but this does not mean, though, that the Son operates uh, independently or, or even against in any, in any reasonable way the Father. He, 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 he always works in agreement with the Father, so the Holy Spirit always works in agreement with the Son and the Father. They're all three of them constantly in agreement and they all have their function in the Godhead and they all are, are happy in that function. Um, it's not as if uh, God the Father would ever take a vacation and say, okay, I'm going to leave you in charge while I'm gone. That's, that, that doesn't happen. So they're always there. They're always eternal. They're always in, in uh, community with each other. Uh, they're, they're never apart one from the other because they're all part of the same person. Just like you're all part of the same person. I, you know, if I go to Virginia Beach, why my mind and my soul go with my body. They don't stay behind and do something else. Uh, they go with me. Okay, in the same sense, uh, God, God operates as one being. Okay, and I operate as one being, but my body still has its role, and my soul still has its role, and my mind still has its role. And so that's, uh, you know, that's just basic understanding of the Trinity and what the Scripture tells us of the Trinity and also uh, helps us to understand because God has made us in his image. Now, that means spiritually in his image, of course. It doesn't mean that we've been made physically in his image. Uh, I'm sorry, but what is the Godhead? Um, the Godhead is the combination of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Um, in other words, it's one God, but there's a headship to it. Uh, and that is that the three of them at the same time are God, uh, if that makes any sense. But that's, that's what we mean by the term Godhead. Um, certainly, that's a that you know it's a term that we've uh, developed. Uh, it it is mentioned in the Bible, um, but it refers to the three in one at the same time. So, um, anyway, uh, did, 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 okay, we're we're going to take a look here. We we understand we understand who Jesus is. Okay, he's the Son of Man and the Son of God at the same time. Okay, he is primarily the son of man in the physical form, but he's primarily spiritually the son of God. And um, as, as he has moved through uh, this period of ministry that we've seen in the Gospels, he refers to himself most often as the son of man. And um, hi, Sherry, good to see you. And um, 
Jesus now is primarily the son of man, but he's also the son of God. And I say, why do I say primarily? Because that's the part that the people can see, feel, and touch. That's the son of man, the, the, the humanity of Jesus. Um, so Jesus is being confronted by the Pharisees. They're trying to pull information out of him. And uh, that information is by what authority do you do these things? Now, he's already proclaimed over and over again by what authority he does. I mean, in John chapters 7 through 10, there was a whole diatribe there of where his authority comes from. And this, this event is beyond that, it's past that in the timeline. And so what we see here then is, is the Pharisees essentially are uh, trying to continually ask him the same question to see if he'll come up with a different answer. Um, it's kind of like what, uh, I don't know if you watch the news a lot. Uh, they were talking one night uh, while I was watching about FBI tactics and how the FBI likes to ask the same question over and over and over again to see if they can get uh, a different answer out of the out of the uh, one that's being interrogated to see if they can uh, trip him up or get him to say something that might uh, be enough of a difference that they can say, oh, so in this case you lied to the FBI, and over here were you telling the truth or was they all a lie? Uh, and and it's a it's a tactic, and uh, obviously the Pharisees are using the same tactic here and. Uh, now you say, well, okay, what about Jesus's wisdom here? How do, where does Jesus get his wisdom? Well, first of all, Jesus is the son of God. Okay, so wisdom is part of his, um, the spirit that we know as God is not, does not have DNA. But if you could let me use a, uh, a an allegory, okay? Uh, wisdom is in God's DNA, okay? Um, so to say that Jesus is being clever, uh, wouldn't quite be right. Uh, to say that he is being inventive wouldn't quite be right. To say that Jesus is answering by the spirit that God has caused to dwell within the son of man, that would be right. Now, I know that it seems like I'm dividing hairs here a little bit, but I'm not. And let me explain why I'm not and why I can say that I'm not. Because for one thing, Jesus has been very, very clear in the scripture. He only does what the Father tells him to do. He only says what he's heard in the presence of his Father. Um, uh, several different comments like this, which indicate that uh, Jesus's testimony about his ministry is that he is an obedient servant. Now he's referred to that as to that in Isaiah 52 and 53 as God's obedient servant. And um, that's exactly what he is here when he comes uh, to the earth and he's behaving as, as he behaves. So in some sense, you might say the spirit that God caused to dwell within the Son of Man is the one that is speaking. That is the Son of God. Um, we also know that the Holy Spirit acts upon the Son of Man as well. Because we read, if you remember, we read in Luke that the Holy Spirit was, the Spirit was upon Christ to heal on a particular occasion. Uh, which um, we see then the, the influence of the Holy Spirit but then we also know that everything that he does, he does because God tells him to do it. The Father tells him to do it. So we know that the Father is acting here. So it is to say that it's not just Jesus, the Son of Man, acting alone, but the entire Trinity is coming to bear upon what Jesus is doing and saying right here. Um, while the Son of, of God, that is the second person, is the manifestation of the Trinity, we see this in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. He's the exact representation and manifestation of God. Um, so we know this to be true as far as the Scripture's testimony is concerned. And uh, we know that, that whatever he is saying to the Pharisees, 
he is saying it not because the son of man is being clever and putting them in their place and socking it to them, but rather instead we know that what he is saying, he is saying because that is what God wants to say to these Pharisees. Now, this is in keeping with what Jesus says would happen with us. For he says later on, and we'll be getting to that soon, but uh, not tonight, but we'll be getting to it soon. But he says regarding us, he says that we'll be called uh, to testify before kings and princes and rulers and judges, and uh, that at that time, we should not worry about what it is that we're going to say, for it will be the Holy Spirit speaking through us uh, rather than just us on our own. So this being the case with the bride of Christ, it certainly would be the case with the bridegroom. And so we can, we can easily extrapolate that that, would, that that would be the case here with the bridegroom, who being the son of man, uh, is functioning the way that the bride would have to function as well, although uh, he is in spirit the Son of God, and uh, not just uh, not just uh, like you and I are. Uh, you know, in in spirit, if you've been converted um, in spirit, why the Holy Spirit dwells within you? Uh, that's the third person of the Trinity, not the second person, but it's still the third person, and uh, still equally uh, related to the rest of the Godhead. Um, what is the likely motivation for this retort? Well, that's the motivation, is that God is telling him to say this. And uh, I, I word these questions a little differently because I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to expose certain truths. And so the question looks like, it looks like I'm trying to say to you that Jesus had some kind of cleverness or some kind of invention going on, when in reality what I'm trying to get at is that he had none. Uh, he just was being obedient. And that, friends, is all that you have to be because it's all that Jesus had to be. Um, now, don't forget, though, that the Bible says he became obedient even to death on a cross. Okay, so your obedience has to be no matter what God decides to do with you. You know, whether he decides to prosper you like Abraham or whether he decides to give you poverty like Elijah, uh, whether he decides to, you know, send you to the cross like, like uh, Peter or some of the other early Christians or whether he decides to let you live until a nice ripe old age like many other Christians have been able to do as well. You don't know what God's going to do with you, but it's got to be good enough for you that it's God doing the work. And the only way that you're going to know it's God doing the work is to follow all of the open doors. When God opens a door, the Bible says he opens doors no man can shut. He shuts doors no man can open. When you obey that and you listen to it and you don't go around kicking down doors, trying to make things happen that you wish would happen. Instead, you just take whatever it is God gives you. And if he doesn't open that door and you really, really wanted it to open, you just go, that's not what God wants. And I want what God wants. And so you make other decisions until, until God either closes the doors or he opens them wide open. And uh, that's one of the, one of the ways that God um, through providence, will lead you. Uh, another way that God leads you, which is not as often, but occasionally the Holy Spirit will speak to your own soul and will tell you what it is he's trying to say, and it's usually a few words. I have not heard the Lord say more than maybe one word at a time, uh, <laughs> maybe sometimes two or three words if he needed to add a preposition. But um, but I ha but I have experienced it. Uh, it does happen, and the Bible says it will happen. So it's not as if uh, what has happened with me uh, is not something that God would do with uh, would not do with other people, because He's done it in the Scripture. He will do it uh, in this day and age. Um, one time He said to me, "Wait." <laughs> Another time He said, "A revival." 
and uh, he, it's not much. He doesn't say much because if he says too much, well, then we're talking about something that may need to be written down as scripture. And we certainly know that the scripture is over with. It's it's a closed book. There's nothing new. And if God even did give us new information that uh, was scripture, so to speak, it would just be a repetition of what's already there. It wouldn't be uh, any new information or anything that we didn't already know. So um, that's kind of a moot point if somebody is wondering about that. Um, we're going to look at uh, question number four now, which is Matthew 21 verses 28 to 32. So let's go ahead and pick up at verse 28. And um, by the way, if you have questions and you and you put a question up, um, I just was looking at the thing that I thought, I thought, well, I just want to be sure nobody has any questions. Um, if you do have a question and I happen to miss it for a little bit, don't worry, I will see it. Because uh, this thing all over here, I've got a little list of comments and it'll just kind of push up and it'll catch the corner of my eye. Uh, starting at verse 28, reading down through verse 32. Uh, but what think ye? A certain man had two sons. And he came to the first and said unto him, Son, go and work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. And he came to the second and said, Likewise. Uh, and he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Whether of them Twain did the will of his father. And they said unto him, The first, Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto thee, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not, but the publicans and the harlots believed him. And yea, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward, that ye might believe him. Okay, so we have a little bit of stuff to unpack here. Okay, one thing is, first of all, remember the context. The context is found in the previous verses that we were just discussing. The Pharisees come to Jesus. They're asking him the same question. They keep asking him over and over again. It's a tactic to trip him up, to get him to say something different. And so this time, instead of answering their question, he just says, I'll answer your question if you will answer my question. Where did John's ministry come from? So then Jesus uh, goes into this parable of two sons and a father. Uh, the father usually represents God. Who do the two sons usually represent? Because this is not the first parable with two sons in it. Um, it seems to indicate that there is a group of people, uh, two groups of people that are being referred to. Now, usually when the scripture refers to two different groups of people, it refers to the Jews and to the Gentiles. That is, those that are part of the kingdom that God created and those that are part of all the other kingdoms uh, around the world. And um, so it's very likely Although it's not explicit, it's very likely that uh, in both cases, the prodigal son and in this case, that there is some representation uh, to the Jews and the Gentiles. Now, again, not explicitly. So I can't teach you that that is absolutely the truth. I can say to you that it's possibly the truth. That's all I can say. Okay, as a pastor... It's my job to tell you what is the truth. Now, if I suspect something might be the truth, I, it's my job to let you know that it's just my suspicion. And so that's what I'm doing right now is letting you know that I have a suspicion here. Okay, so as he lights into this story about two sons, we'll talk about the parable in a little bit. It ends with him talking about, the, about two responses. And the first response is the response of the Pharisees. And the second is the response of the harlots. But he lights into them right away 
and tells them, I'm telling you the truth, the harlots and the publicans are going to heaven before you because they heard and they believed and you didn't. Now, he doesn't even say, hey, you guys are the first group and you're the ones that, or you're, you're the second group, the ones that said that, that you um, would, but you didn't. And the publicans and the harlots are the first group, the ones that said they wouldn't, but did. That's not what he, that he's not even saying that here. Um, he's just simply using this parable as a way to, uh, as a way to, to light into uh, what is happening on an historical level. Um, so discuss the parable. Is it a warning or just a condemnation of the Pharisees? Um, I want you to be sure that you understand this, okay? Because a lot of our preaching and teaching is basically where it comes to Jesus and the Pharisees is that Jesus didn't like the Pharisees and the Pharisees didn't like Jesus. Uh, it, that's essentially the, the way that preaching comes across. Now, whether they mean to do that or not, I don't know, but it's the way that they come across. Okay, Jesus loved the Pharisees. Okay, please understand that. He loved the Pharisees. Was he angry with them? Certainly. Certainly he was angry with them from time to time. But do you think he was angry with Nicodemus the whole time he was talking to Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee? Do you think that Jesus was angry when he stopped Paul on the road to Damascus? Don't you think that if that was the case, don't you think that Jesus could have uh, done a whole lot worse than smiting him with blindness for a few days? Um, no, he loved the Pharisees. You see, God has, let's back it up from Jesus to God. God has a good will towards everyone. He wants everyone to, to repent. He wants everyone to do well. He wants everyone to become a Christian. That being said, he knows that not everyone will. Okay, he, he knows who will and he knows who won't. But that doesn't stop him from having a good will, a benevolent will. Bene meaning good, volent meaning volition or will. He has a benevolence towards all men. And not only that, but God is beneficent towards all men. That is, he, he gives rain to the righteous and to the unrighteous. He doesn't favor the righteous over the unrighteous in the giving out of common graces and common mercies to everyone. Yes, he treats the church differently. He treats the church with complacent love. That is, God is completely at ease with the church. Now, what, what do I mean by the church? Well, certainly I don't mean the organization. Okay, there's plenty of organizations that are way, 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 way out in left field right now. Okay, what I mean there is I mean the organic church. That is the living, breathing organism known as the body of Christ. So when I say that he loves the church, that's what I'm talking about. And God treats us with complacent love. He's completely at ease with us. You say, well, but what about all my sins? What about all my failures? What about all of my problems? Do you not know that the blood of Christ was sufficient and that that blood took away all of your sins? Not just the ones you'd committed up to a certain point, but all of them. Because God knows every sin you're going to commit after he converts you. He knows every stumbling. He knows every falling. Otherwise, there would be no need for sanctification. Okay, sanctification is a discipleship process. And it takes us from where God finds us to where God is bringing us. And in no case... Uh, does our response to sanctification uh, need to be clever or need to be uh, somehow uh, independent of God? Our response to sanctification should be to learn how to be obedient and to obey the Lord, just to obey him, to follow his lead, to be satisfied with whatever he gives you, to, to not push the issue, to not make things, try and make things into what you wish they were, but rather instead to give your heart fully and completely to him and be able to say, God, 
if you cause me to live, wonderful. God, if you choose to to end my life, then beautiful. If you if you prosper me, then beautiful. If you give me poverty, then beautiful. But you know what the scripture says? The scripture says, give me neither poverty nor wealth. That's what the scripture says. That's the prayer of the saint to God. Give me neither poverty nor wealth. Well, that certainly flies in the face of some of our preaching today because you have prosperity preachers on the one hand saying all you got to do is just tell God what it is you want. You want a million dollars, you want a new car, you you know, he's uh, Bob Barker up in the sky and you just ask him what it is you want and he's going to give it to you. But on the other hand, although they're not very many anymore, okay, but there still are some and it used to be a bigger thing that that the preachers preached poverty. And they said they said that, that God doesn't want to prosper us. Now, this was in the old days. We're talking early 1900s to the 1800s. God doesn't want to prosper us because we may become too haughty. We may become too, uh, too proud. We may become too, uh, you know, too uh, independent and, and forget God, you know, and there's some scriptures that seem to indicate that, and that was kind of what they used to latch on to, and then there was a, there's some scriptures that seem to indicate God would like to prosper us, and so there's there's those that have latched on to those passages, and neither one is correct, because the scripture says a man of God will avoid all extremes, and then the scripture also says, give me neither po- wealth nor poverty. Uh, we don't want anything from God other than to obey him, to know his will, to do what it is he wants us to do. That's all we want. And the Bible says that God works in us both to will and to act. So that is a huge relief, especially for those of us who think we're supposed to somehow figure out the unfigurable it's not, you can't figure out God's will. God's will is God's will, and he'll do with you what he chooses to do with you. For Abraham, it was, a, it was to prosper him because God was building a nation through Abraham. Uh, through Elijah, it was poverty because uh, God needed Elijah to live outside of the favor of his king because his king was wicked. And, uh, you know, for Jesus, it was to go to the cross, and that's his own son. Uh, You know, what's God's will for you? Well, you're not going to find it by trying to copy somebody in the Bible. God's will for you is God's will for you. Uh, You won't be able to look to the 1800s to the missionaries and say, oh, that's what I want. That's what I need to be. I need to give myself away for God. No, no, no. You just need to obey him. Just obey him. Now, if he calls you to the jungle, whatever, but just obey him, okay? Do what he is asking you to do. And that's all that we need. Now, in this parable, why we have two boys, that one is, uh, at the outset, is rebellious, but changes his mind. The other one at the outset is uh, claims that he would obey, but then doesn't. Okay, so the the parable is short. The answer is simple. Which one obeyed him? The one that actually obeyed him is the one that obeyed him, not the one that told him with his lips what he wanted to hear or didn't want to hear. And uh, Jesus then lights into the Pharisees and says, the harlots and the publicans are going to heaven before you because they believed John's testimony. Now, this is going back to their question about uh, John's ministry, who was it from, or Jesus' question about John's ministry, who was it from? And so here, Jesus is not delineating which the younger son is and the older son is, but rather that there are two, there's one question with two responses. And at first the one says no, but then goes. And the other one at first says yes, but then doesn't. And Jesus is just simply trying to tell them that like these two sons, um, why 
The Pharisees say with their mouth, I will, but they don't. And the harlots and publicans have said with their mouth, I won't, but then they hear the gospel and their mind is changed. Now you say, well, here's something odd that we know that only those that God saves are saved. We know this. Whom the Son sets free, they are free indeed. Whom the Son sets free. Now, this does not mean whoever agrees with Jesus is going to be freed. That's not what that means. Okay, we also see in chapter 36 of Ezekiel, uh, a list of things that God says, I'm going to do this. I'm going to take your heart of stone, and give your heart of flesh. All kinds of things that God only can do to save. So we know from the scripture, from the broader context, that salvation is something only God could do. So why would Jesus point to the, the moral responsibility of the Pharisees and the publicans and harlots as evidence of the change of heart. The reason that he does is because in spite of the fact that you and I cannot save ourselves or prepare ourselves for heaven, even with the best of instruction, we still have a responsibility to obey God. And if we're not obeying God, even if God hasn't helped us in that area, we still have a moral responsibility to do that. And you say, well, maybe that's not fair. Well, it's not that it's fair or not. It's whether it's right or not. <clears throat> now, to most of us, fairness is righteousness. Not to God, though. To God, righteousness is righteousness. And it, it, there's no other synonym for it. Uh, whatever God wants to happen, whatever God sees as right and wrong, he has the right to do that. He's the creator. He's the king. The one who creates get to, gets to say what's right and wrong. I mean, if your five-year-old is creating a picture of a duck, and they make the duck purple with white polka dots, and nothing like that exists in nature, yet because that five-year-old is the one that created, that five-year-old gets the right, has the right to make a purple duck with white polka dots, if that's what they want to do, because they're the creator. In the same sense, folks, God's your creator. He gets to do with you whatever he wants to do with you. The Bible says this, God does whatever he pleases in heaven and on earth. Whatever he pleases. Okay, can, can I run that phrase by you again? God does whatever he pleases in heaven and on earth. Not just in heaven, but on earth. Okay, now... That's hard to swallow. That's a hard one. Excuse me. <coughs> Made myself cough. Now, it may be hard to swallow. But if it's the reality that you're dealing with, you had best get on the reality wagon and get off of the fantasy wagon because the fantasy wagon is on its way to hell. It's not on its way to heaven. Okay, so getting on the reality wagon is important. God does whatever he pleases in heaven and on earth. Why? Because he's the creator. Does not the creator have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some vessels to honor and some to dishonor? Does the pot have the right to say to the potter, why have you made me thus? This is the scripture. I'm 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 giving you Romans nine here, and I'm giving you um, I'm, I'm giving you other passages as well. <clears throat> this is the scripture, folks. So 
when these people are responding the way that they are and Jesus is referencing their moral responsibility, not necessarily referencing the sovereignty of God in the matter, but their moral responsibility, it's because that's something that they're supposed to be able to do what they can about it. They're, they they should be able to say, not just, yes, I'll obey and then not, but yes, I'll obey and actually obey. And then you have those that are, that are uh, also somewhat dichotomous because they'd say, nah, nah, I'm not going to do it. And then later on they say, you know what, I believe I ought to do that. Now I, I did allude to the fact that these could be representing the Gentiles and the and the Jews, and it's possible that it could be. Again, it's not explicit though. Um, you know, it could be that he's saying that the Gentiles initially said no, and the Jews initially said yes, which fits, and that later that that is after Jesus's uh, resurrection and ascension why the ministry is going to move to what Jesus calls the times of the Gentiles. And uh, that the times of the Gentiles, the Gentiles that originally said no, their descendants are now going to be saying yes. Uh, and the Jews that whose, whose ancestors had originally said yes, their descendants are going to be saying no. And uh, I, th there, is, there, there is certain... Uh, obvious uh, correlation between the idea that this might be the Jews and the Gentiles that he's speaking of, uh, even though in the immediate he's speaking of the uh, harlots and publicans versus the Pharisees. So uh, looking at the time, okay. Well, I don't think we're going to get through all of five here but we are going to get started on it. We're looking at verses 33 to 46 now in Matthew. And the story, of course, is carried in the other two synoptic gospels, Mark and Luke. Okay, starting up at verse 33, going down through verse 46, that is the end of the chapter. Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and uh, hang on just a second um, <clears throat> excuse me I'm sorry I I have to do something and I will be right back talk amongst yourselves Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. Um, hopefully you're still watching. But uh, just to kind of explain myself a little, 
why I've been dealing with a kidney stone for about a week. And just before the meeting, this, this Bible study, um, why it passed. And it's kind of wreaking havoc with me a little. But I apologize. I would never have done that if I could have helped it. Okay. Um, hopefully everyone's still with us. God bless you for staying and uh, not thinking that if I wasn't going to stay, you didn't need to. Okay, Matthew 21, verses 33 to 46. Going back to the scripture. Here we go. That's where we left off. Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged it, digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to his husbandman and went out into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he went, he, he sent his servants to the husbandman and that they might receive the fruit of it. And the husbandman took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them uh, likewise. And last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir, come, let us kill him, that, uh, and, and let us um, seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. And when the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto these husbandmen and they say unto him he will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen which shall render him the fruits in their seasons jesus saith unto them did ye never read the scripture the stone which the builders rejected the same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and shall be given to a nation, bringing forth the fruit thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone will be broken, but whomsoever upon which it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived he spake of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude, because they took him for a prophet. There's a lot of words, and we've got a lot to cover. Uh, but we don't have time for all of the questions. So, um, so anyways, uh, <laughs> oh, it's okay. No need to apologize. Thank you. And congratulations on the birth of the stone. <laughs> oh, Sherry, you cracked me up. Uh, and I am glad that it's gone. Oh, it, it was giving me flu-like symptoms. It was terrible. So, anyways, though. Um, looking at uh, this parable, uh, this is the first question before we get to A. This parable is a history lesson as well as a judgment, and why can we say that? Well, because Jesus is talking about what God is going to do with his vineyard and that he's going to let it out to people, uh, that it's not going to be them, but it's going to be a different nation. Now, that brings up a question and I'm going to give you an answer to the question because I think the question uh, is so puzzling 
that if I leave it lay out there in the ether world, why <laughs> you're going to be like puzzling over it. The Bible says that God is going to take the vineyard from this nation, that is Israel, and give it to another nation that will yield its fruit in due season. This has given rise to something that we call replacement theology, okay? Replacement theology is the idea that the church has replaced the kingdom of Israel <coughs> and that the promises God made to Israel no longer apply to them, but now apply to the church. <coughs> But we can't say that. Replacement theology is not right. Okay? The scripture says God's gifts are without repentance. That means... <coughs> excuse me, please. That means that what God promised to Israel, God's going to fulfill. Now, replacement theology becomes very necessary if you have an amillennial eschatology, and here's big words for you, amillennial, no millennium. In other words, no real 1,000 year reign of Jesus. That's what the millennium is, 1,000 year reign of Jesus, which the Bible says is real and will happen at the end of the human era. The next thing is uh, amillennial and then eschatology just simply means study of the end times. So if your idea of the end times includes a spiritual millennium, but not an actual millennium. That is an allegorical. What they mean is allegorical when they say spiritual. That's not what the Bible means when it says spiritual. It doesn't mean allegorical. Now, where I live, we're very, very much influenced in this area uh, with the Seventh-day Adventist theology, which is replacement theology. And uh, it is... Uh, a millennial, and it is um, uh, the, uh, the the things that they believe don't fit with the scripture. It ignores pieces of the scripture and uh, touts other pieces of the scripture. And so just like most, uh, most near Christianities, why uh, Seventh-day Adventism uh, speaks enough Christianity that you would like to think they're okay, but they deny enough, uh, enough scripture that they're not okay, unfortunately. Um, so what is he talking about then about this other nation? The other nation is the church. Okay, so you say, well, then you just said that it wasn't, and now you're saying it was. No, that's not what's going on. What I'm saying is the church does not replace Israel. Okay, the church, the Bible says that once you were not a people, but now you're a people. Once you were not a nation, but now you are a nation. Okay, so the church is in its own way a nation of a sort. Okay, it's in its own way a people. Um, but we were not a people before, but now we are a people. Why? Because we're the people of Christ. We've been born again which the old kingdom was not born again. The old kingdom was not a converted kingdom. It was a created kingdom. And the ones that God had created and the ones that God had nurtured, the ones that God had spent all of his time with that he invested himself into, they rejected him. And so God is moving on to the church during the, age, during the times of the Gentiles, he's moved, which is where we are now, He's moving on to the church so that the church uh, will return to him the praises and the fruits and the, and the things that are due to him. But the church, it said in Romans 11, uh, only has the promises of Israel apply to it because we've been grafted in to the olive tree that is cultivated, that is Israel. You and I have been grafted into it. Uh, we will serve Israel. Israel will still be the empire that God promised, 
uh, Jesus will still rule from Jerusalem as he always promised. All of his promises to Israel will be fulfilled, but now they include the church, who the church is kind of to Christ like the nobility is to a king, the earls and the dukes and the duchesses and all of this, okay? That's the nobility, okay? We are to, to Christ, uh, the nobility. We're in a sense, in a sense, we're his queen, in a sense. And um, we will judge with him, according to the scriptures, in the millennial kingdom. For the scripture says, I will restore your judges as in days of old, Isaiah 126. Then it's Jesus says to the, to the apostles, you'll sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Paul says to the church in general in 1 Corinthians 6, do you not know you will judge angels? Do you not know that you will judge nations? And then in Revelation 20, Jesus has his throne and it's surrounded by many thrones. And that is the thrones of the judges of the earth during the millennial kingdom. Okay, so I know this is a lot that I'm laying on you, but what I'm trying to do is give you enough foundational information that you can understand some of the, some of the more simple truth that should be simple, but they're not simple because if you don't know what Jesus is talking about, then it's just gobbledygook. And, you know, you don't need to waste an hour of your time on a Thursday evening to listen to gobbledygook. You need to listen to actual facts and, and actual study. And that's why this is a Bible study. Um, so, certainly, this is an history lesson, and it's also a judgment. And uh, we've explained why we can say that. Let's move on to question A. Why does Matthew say that the crowd answered, yet Mark and Luke say Jesus answered his own question? Uh, how does Luke say the crowd reacted? Okay, so in Matthew, it says that the crowd said he will, they, uh, that he will uh, miserably destroy those wicked men. Okay, that that was what the crowd said to him. But in, Matt, in uh, Mark and Luke, it says Jesus said this to him. Now, is this, have you finally found the disagreement between the synoptic gospels that justifies your claim or your friend's claim or your enemy's claim, whatever, that uh, the that the scripture is not inerrant after all. Ha! Have you found that? Well, actually, no, you've not. You've not. Because what we see here simply is a difference in uh, t storytelling, and that's it. Nothing substantial here. Okay? It, it could very well be that, they, that Jesus asked them and that they had all these answers, including this one, and Jesus kind of points at the one guy and says, ah, you know, it could be that that's the way that it went down. But that doesn't mean that there's a substantial difference here. And it doesn't mean that that the, that the uh, just because, uh, you know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't fully word it exactly the same. And as I've said before, right? Okay, with the Gospels, Let's say you're a teacher and you have four students that are supposed to do an essay question. And when they turn in the essay, their essays are identical. Everything all the way from the dots to the exclamation points and punctuation mark. What's your first reaction? Is it, wow, I've got four geniuses on my hand. It's not going to be your reaction, is it? You're going to be like, okay, well, somebody's cheating here. So if the four Gospels were identical in exactly the way they worded things or told their stories, then that would be further evidence that this is not a legitimate Gospel. It would not be evidence that it was legitimate. It would be evidence that it was not. Okay, 
So this is, this is a legitimate gospel. And one of the ways that we know is that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and when John is telling the same story, which he doesn't usually, but whenever they are, and they tell it differently, but yet no difference in the substantial truth about what is going on, why then what we have here is true story, different way of telling it. And that's it. You know, Matthew says there were two demoniacs. The others say there was one demoniac. Okay, what does that mean? Well, the one demoniac was the one that spoke, and the other one didn't say anything. Matthew saw two, and he mentions that there was two, but Luke and Mark talk about the one that said something. And so they said they talk about him. That's all. That's all. No, no substantial difference here. Not at all, just a difference in storytelling, difference in details. That's all there is. And it's not a problem at all. Um, okay, how does Luke say that the crowd reacted? Let's take a look in the, in the uh, Gospel of Luke. We're looking at uh, verses 9 through 19 to get the, um, to get the gist of what uh, we're reading. Luke chapter 20. And uh, verses 9 to 19. Now, their, their reaction, according to Luke, was that they said the phrase, God forbid. God forbid that, that uh, he should take the gospel from the nation that has had it for years, centuries, and give it over to some other nation. Now, the crowd has this reaction of God forbid. We don't see that in Mark and, and Matthew. But here, as Luke was doing his research, somebody remembered the crowd saying, God forbid. Now, that's an important phrase. Because what this means is, it's not as if the crowd didn't care. And it's not as if the Pharisees didn't care, for the Pharisees were angry. But they knew that this was about them. So what did they do? Did they repent? No. They turned on Jesus with ferocity. But they couldn't seize him because they were more afraid of the crowd than they were angry at Jesus at the time. Okay, well, it's 8.02. That leaves us with two questions uh, at the tail end, still referring to this particular parable, and uh, we will take care of it next week. So, oh, well, we've had an interesting night at least, right? Right, okay. God bless you folks. Let's have a word of prayer as we close. Thank you, Lord, for your kindness to us. Thank you, Lord, for your word. We pray, Lord, that you would give us uh, a certain and complete view of the Gospels so that we would walk faithfully as you walked, so that we would see that our uh, critics are not criticizing as they think on substance, but rather criticizing on, uh, on peripherals and, and unessential, non-essential, and silly things. Help us, Lord, I pray, to walk firmly and to stand firmly before those who would criticize us and bring us to question. In Jesus' name, Lord, we pray. Amen. All right, folks. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you for being so kind when I had to, to leave the camera for a moment. But uh, you have been very kind to me. And I trust that God has been very kind to you tonight.